What's up everyone? Pastor Adam here. I hope that you are doing great wherever you're watching this from. I am really excited that you are with us to begin this new teaching series called Embodied. Over the next few weeks, we are going to be thinking about what it means to believe the gospel that Jesus Christ came in a human body, died a human death, rose again in a physical body, and is coming back to renew a physical world. What's that mean for us? And what does that mean specifically for how we should live together as embodied people? Is Christianity just a religion that's about the spirit, that's just about stuff kind of up there in heaven, or, or does it have real tangible effects on how we live our lives in this body and with one another? Well, that's what the series is all about. And so today, we're going to be thinking about what our embodied faith is even all about. So to do that, we're going to read three scriptures. I'm going to pray, and then God is going to speak to us by faith wherever you happen to be. So let's dive into these three texts. The first one comes from the Gospel of John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, it says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the second scripture that we read comes to us from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the third scripture we're going to read comes from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it says this, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of the Lord. Father, help us today as we think about what our embodied faith is. Speak to us about how we can live in this body in a way that honors you and live together an embodied church life in a way that speaks to the world about how great you truly are. In Jesus' name, amen. Social distance. If there is a set of words that have gotten more usage than they probably ever have in the history of the English language, it's probably the set of words, social distance. For the last 14 months, we have been told, we've been encouraged, we've been demanded. In some places, we've been even penalized if we haven't been socially distant. Now, as a epidemiological kind of tool to, to keep a global pandemic at bay, perhaps that's been great. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But I can tell you that as a Christian and as a human, social distance has had a massively negative effect on our embodied lives. Let me give you some stats about that. Um, loneliness is now rampant among young adults. Uh, in, in one particular article in the Harvard Crimson, it says this, perhaps most striking of the pandemic is that 61% of those aged 18 to 25 now report a very high intolerable level of loneliness. Whoa, that's insane. How about this next study? It says this, a new national survey looking at how the COVID pandemic has impacted young adults' loneliness reveals, quote, significant depressive symptoms in 80% of participants. The results show that the most participants who reported an increase in feelings of loneliness also indicated an increase in drinking, drug use, anxiety, and depression, and a decrease in feeling of connectedness. That's, that's huge. Now, now, just that right there should give us pause to think about wh what it means that we humans are, are embodied creatures and not just mental or, or virtual. But for the church, it's even worse. During the pandemic, one in three Christians stopped going to church altogether, N not just physically, but online, just disengaged from their local church community. That's, that's incredibly unhealthy. Further, some research is suggesting that when the dust settles, one in five churches in the United States will have closed due to the pandemic and the effects of this disembodiment, this social distance on the people of God. Finally, the stress and the ugliness of the 2020 political season and everything that our country was going through saw many of us who call ourselves Christians participating in online gossip, outrage, slander, and all kinds of other things that suddenly felt more plausible because we weren't going to see each other the next Sunday, because we weren't going to settle disagreements in person, and we weren't going to have real discussions as we ought. Friends, social distance, while it has probably had a very important and good effect on our handling of a global pandemic has had a terrifically negative effect on us as a church. 
That's why we're doing this teaching series called Embodiment, because we need to remember why it even matters that we get together at all, why this physical world even matters, why it's important for you to understand, even though you're watching this online right now and experiencing church online, why you need to know that church fully cannot be experienced online. So what are we gonna do about this? What do we say? Today, we're going to consider the good news of God's embodiment in the gospel and how that even matters for us. The good news of God's embodiment. That, that good news, we're gonna be meditating on it for the next four weeks, but today, I just wanna consider with you what the good news of God's embodiment is, why it matters, and what it does on the inside of us. So what is the good news of God's embodiment? Well, we read uh, John chapter one, verse 14. At the very end of John's prologue, he, read, he says this, and we'll read it again. The word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love the way the Apostle John tells the Christmas story because in his version of the Christmas story, there's no shepherds and man mangers and all that good stuff. In his Christmas story, we're simply told the word, the very word, the let there be light that was present at the beginning of creation has become flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, if you dig underneath in the original language, it's really even more interesting than that. It says that Jesus, the, the word has come to tabernacle among us. That, that's the, the word that, um, that is used in the original language. And that's, that's profoundly interesting because that word tabernacle has a, has a long and important history in the Old Testament. Tabernacle was the name of that worship tent that uh, Moses was commanded to build when the people of God left slavery in Egypt. Tabernacle is what the temple was. It was God's presence in the world for ancient Israel. Tabernacling was, was God's living with humans and humans living with God. And since the destruction of the temple, that experience was not happening amongst God's people until the temple was rebuilt. And even when it was rebuilt, you can read this in the prophets, that there was a sense of it's not the way it was and, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. And so when we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the original readers of that particular text would have felt like a long question had been answered. When is God going to come back and dwell with his people. You see, the good news of God's embodiment is that God in Jesus Christ has finally come once again to be with his people. Now, now, why is that good news? Well, in the beginning, God made the physical world, and seven times in the very first chapter of our Bible, we are told that it is good. Physicality is not kind of ancillary to spirituality. It's, it's not as though God made the world kind of spiritual up here and physical down here, and the physical stuff is, nah, it's fine, but the spiritual stuff, that's really where the money's at. No. In the beginning, God made a physical world that was wrapped in, bathed in the spiritual. In the beginning, the Holy Spirit was the one through whom the world was even made. It says the Spirit of God was hovering, fluttering over the face of nothingness, and along with the Word of God, everything began to form. You see, the physical world matters to God. It matters so much that in the poetry of the first chapter of your Bible, God is sticking his hands in the dirt and forming the first human and breathing into him his own spirit, his own breath that he might have life. The physical world was made good and we were made part of that physical world. Now, the physical world became not good in, in two ways. Before sin, the only not good thing was that the first human was alone. If you read in Genesis chapter 2, God himself says, everything's good, everything's awesome, everything's great. It is not good that this human, this man, should be alone. See, you and I were made not merely for our own individual embodiment, but to have life, embodied life, near one another. We were not made for social distance. And long-term social distance has a severely negative impact on us. And part of the way we know that is in the beginning, when the first person was socially distant from every other human, God said it wasn't good. It wasn't good then, and friend, it's not good now. So, the good news of God's embodiment is that after sin entered the world, when the first humans turned their backs on God and gave God's good world away to God's enemy and became enslaved to God's enemy, God promised to come and crush that enemy and return his people back to his presence. God made that promise. And when Jesus Christ came, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that was the answer 
to a long, long, millennia long promise to redeem and renew the world. Now, some of you have heard the gospel, something like this. God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived and he died and he rose so that if you believe in him and receive him as your personal Lord and Savior, you can go to heaven when you die. That's true. That's true. It is true that if you trust Jesus, when you die, you will go to heaven. But it's not the whole truth, and it's certainly not the whole point of the gospel. The whole point of the gospel is resurrection. You see, Jesus died and then he rose in a real physical body and he told his first disciples, listen, go tell the whole world about the good news of what I've done. I'm going to pour my spirit out upon you and, and listen, I'm going to be with you even to the very end. And Jesus promised to return and renew all things with his return. There's a time coming when God is going to fully be with his people once again. That is the good news of God's embodiment. Now, resurrection in the first century, that, that was an idea that was already there, but it wasn't at all to be expected that God's Messiah would die and rise, and then later on, God's people would rise again. That, that was not anywhere. That was a total innovation of the Christian gospel. And here in the Christian gospel, we learn that resurrection Resurrection doesn't just mean that my spirit goes upstairs to be with God in the spirit, but rather that God himself is returning to the world and is going to raise my physical body, renew it, and enable me, if I have trusted in Jesus, to live in a new physical world with him forever. That's incredibly good news. That means that what you do in this world matters. That means that God's concern about ecology, God's concern about humanity, God's concern about the body, God's concern about society isn't just decorative, it's central. The good news of God's embodiment is that God has become man in Jesus Christ, that he lived out the first fully perfect version of human embodiment and human relationships. In his death, he experienced the outcome of our broken version of those things. And in his resurrection, not only did he defeat death, but he made a way for our future resurrected embodiment too. And now, by his spirit, we begin to live out a version, a, a foretaste of that future promise. That's what's so amazing. What's so strange and wonderful and innovative and unexpected about the good news of God's embodiment is that it breaks the resurrection promise into steps by the Holy Spirit, we walk in part of that resurrection life right now, both in our physical bodies, our individual selves, but most importantly, in the glorious church of Jesus Christ. You see, we were made to glorify God and enjoy him with one another. Some of you, you've been in your home for 12, 14 months because of this pandemic, and you've been watching church online and reading your Bible by yourself. And listen, I am glad for you. I am grateful for your faithfulness, but I want you to know you can't live this way forever. You can't live watching God's people on your phone forever or on your television forever because you and I were not saved to do this virtually. We were saved to do it in reality, in embodied, personal interaction. That is the good news of God's embodiment, that in his spirit and in his church, we can be together living out a living parable of the good news of what God's new world is going to be like. That's why our relationships matter so much. Which takes us to the second thing. Why does the good news of God's embodiment matter? I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, wait, Pastor, you just told me that the good news of God's embodiment, you know, partially means that if I believe in it, then I'll, you know, I'll go to heaven when I die. And, and that's what I, as an individual, want. Listen, I'm an American too. We're all downstream of individualism, and, and none of us cannot think in individualistic ways just because of when and where we happen to live in the history of humanity. But just because we're in a ruggedly individualistic society does not mean that our gospel is purely or merely individualistic. The good news of God's embodiment matters because your body matters. You're not going to live in heaven forever when you die. Sure, if I pass away today, before the general resurrection, my, my spirit will go to be with the Lord. That's true. But that is not the ultimate end place of my spirit. While, while my spirit will go and be at rest with God, when the trumpet sounds, according to 1 Corinthians 15, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will all be changed to be like 
him. The good news of God's embodiment matters because it means that my future is a resurrected physical future and it's not merely an individual resurrected future. It is a corporate, together, embodied, resurrected future. Going to heaven, therefore, is not the point. The point is a new life in your body and within the church that is filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. You can't live that way alone. I can't live that way in my living room singing just with my kids. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to make any of you feel bad at all. I get it. It's sort of cool to be able to, to have Sunday back if you've been used to, like me, you know, having four services on a Sunday and teaching a bunch of classes and stuff. But me having my Sundays is not the point. The good news of God's embodiment matters because how we relate to one another as Christians in embodied life by the Holy Spirit is how the world knows that we even belong to God in the first place. This is what Jesus says. They're gonna know you're my disciples not by your tweets, not by your social media interaction, not by your sharing the online live stream, though we're glad when you do that. They're gonna know you're my disciples, Jesus says, by your love for one another. That takes us to our second scripture. The good news of God's embodiment matters because God's people receive the Spirit together. We read in Acts chapter 2 this, that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together. Just write, just underline that in your Bible, circle it. It wasn't that Peter was over here and James was over here and John was back. No, they were together waiting on God to do something. They were together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rushing wind and tongues of fire descended on them. And the rest of the book of Acts is the story of how that filling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit worked out to change the world with the good news of the gospel. The Spirit-filled church is the body of Christ. This is amazing. This is why Paul would write in Romans 8 that if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That means that our future together is a resurrected future and we live out the anticipation, the beginnings, the foretaste, the appetizer, the preview of that resurrected future together. Friend, I need you to live out my Christian faithfulness. And, and you need me, and we need each other. I can't embody and live out faithful Christian life without other Christians close to me in proximity, without people in my life. I just can't. The good news of God's embodiment matters because it means that we can now, we finally have the chance to live in shalom with one another, in, in peace with one another. Listen, our world has no idea how to live together peacefully. If 2020 has shown us anything, it's that the ties, the sinews that hold our civilization together are very, very tenuous indeed. Economic ties, nationalistic ties, racial ties, th these ties are, are thin and they're fraying at the edges. But what if there was a transnational, supra-racial, involving all economic distributions and backgrounds. And some group like that, that was so committed to loving one another that though their commitment did not dissolve their differences, it did transform them into something new and beautiful. Brothers and sisters, I'm describing the church of Jesus Christ. And when we become part of the church, we are given by the Spirit the opportunity to live out that life in an embodied way. Which takes us to the third thing. The good news of God's embodiment is the gospel that I just shared with you. And it matters for all the reasons that I've just said so that we can, by the Spirit, live out God's purposes on the earth. So what does the good news of God's embodiment do? 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Did, did you catch it? Now, if I were to translate it more um, Literally, it would say this. Now, y'all are the body of Christ, and you are individually members of it. Do you see what the apostle's doing? He's saying, it, it's God's people, the, the weird and wonderful, the, the diverse and yet unified group of people that have turned from sin and trusted the Savior Jesus. It's God's people who are together the body of Christ and individually members of it. Listen, it's not merely that I am the body of Christ. I am not the body of Christ. 
we are, and I cannot faithfully participate in his body without your faithful participation. That's why we have to live this embodied Christian life together. If believed on in faith, this means that we are transformed into God's children and we are given the promise of a future resurrection. The other good thing that God's good news of embodiment does is it unites a disparate people and even sworn enemies into one new living family. And how we live together in that family matters, man. It matters. Our world has to see a church living in unity. Otherwise, why would they believe anything we have to say? If there's more unity in the Republican Party than there is in the Church of Jesus Christ, we have a problem. If there's more unity in the Democratic Party than the Church of Jesus Christ, we have a problem. If there's more unity in your company or on a sports team than there is in the body of Jesus Christ, then we have a problem because the good news of God's embodiment is meant to create in us such a new, such a, an incomprehensible yet totally attractive kind of spirit-wrought unity that the world looks on us and says, their God must be very great. That's what the good news of God's embodiment is meant to do. This online church thing, man, it's been great. It's been, I, I'm unimaginably thankful for it. I'm so grateful for the people who develop these tools. I'm so grateful for our team who are running the cameras and editing. I'm so grateful for your faithful participation. I'm grateful that because of technology, even in a global pandemic, we can in some way, at least virtually, have been together. But friends, we cannot remain like this forever. We just can't. This good news of God's embodiment um, challenges some of the some of the things that, that mess us up. And, and church online, you know, if you've been following Jesus for a while and church online, you know, has become a thing for you, it can also develop some bad habits. Can we just be honest? Now, I know you're watching this online and you're like, man, he's being, he's kind of going after his audience. Look, I, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but let's be honest. It's kind of formed some bad habits, right? Like, it it forces us to not have to deal with maybe some of our fear about going outside. Listen, pandemic is real, COVID is real, Risk is real, and yet so is life. And, and if our fear is going to keep us inside, we can't live faithfully. Now, I recognize that some of you are at greater health risk than others, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel super bad, but I'm also not gonna qualify what I just said into meaninglessness. If you're seized by fear, then you can't live in faith. The scriptures say that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, and just kinda live and watch in church on my phone doesn't force me to deal with my fear or live in any more faith. Also, for me, church online has forced me to get in some bad habits, made me lazy. It, it's gotten me undisciplined and undiscipled from getting up in the mornings and going to church and seeing people that otherwise I would not see. But since coming back, man, I've been so blessed to see folks that I forgot that I loved, that I forgot that I knew. It, it's been absolutely wonderful. And some of you, man, the good news of God's embodiment is meant to make you move toward God's people, not remain in your living room. And finally, some of the, some of the church online, the, the bad habits that it's forced us into is a kind of nominalism because it doesn't matter how I live for Jesus alone if how I live for Jesus alone never moves me out beyond myself and my own. It, it just doesn't matter. We are called to love one another and love God, but we can only love God and others by loving God with others. Can I say that again? You and I can only love God and others by loving God with others. That's the whole point of Jesus having come to us and dwelt among us and tabernacling with us and giving his spirit to us and then sending us to others so that through us others might know him that in the end they might get a physical resurrection too that we might all be together with the Lord that's the goal of the good news of God's embodiment while a digital platform can serve as a great tool it can never replace the gathering of God's church because gathering is part of the gift the scriptures say that the writer of John's epistles says that I've got lots of things that I want to share with you, but I, I want to say them to your face. In the beginning of Romans, the apostle Paul says, listen, I long to be with you so that I can impart some spiritual gift to you so that you and I might mutually refresh one another. Listen, if you're watching this and you haven't been uh, to, to a gathering in a while, I want to say, I long to be with you. Your church longs to be with you. Your, your people long to be with you, that we might impart some spiritual gift to you, and that you might impart one to us, and that we might mutually encourage one another. We started this sermon by 
kind of reciting some of the bad news of the pandemic, some of the terrible things that loneliness has done. It's increased, you know, depression and anxiety and, and substance abuse and all the bad things that, are, that it's causing in the church. But just imagine this. We in the church have the answer to this isolation crisis. We have the answer to all of the unforeseen negative outcomes of social distance because we have a bond that goes deeper than affinity or politics or economy or ethnicity. We have a bond that is created by the God who became man in Jesus Christ, died for us, rose for us, and unites us in peaceful resurrection unity in his spirit. We have the answer for this pandemic of isolation. It just means we gotta get embodied. We have to embody this faith with one another and together. So, as we end our time together, I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge you on three levels. I wanna challenge you on your thinking, in your emotions, and then in your actions. The good news of God's embodiment has to change how we think because we have to remember the embodiment of the gospel. We have to remember the good news of a God who didn't just sit up in heaven and like give us messages or appear to us you know, virtually in visions. He became one of us. He walked among us that he might stand in solidarity with us and actually save us so that we might trust him that he could give salvation to us. You gotta remember that, friends. We serve an incarnational God and he has charged us with an incarnational mission. It's why we're called to greet one another with, with love and affection. It's not, not a socially distant wave. Physical presence with one another, physical embodiment, is a spiritual gift. The second level I want to challenge you on is your emotions. I, I want you to get in the mind and in the heart of that isolated place. Some of you, it's real easy because you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Some of your friends you know, they're, they're just seized with fear and they're still locked in their homes and they're, they're, just, they're just quite afraid. Enter that emotional space for just a minute. Imagine then what the good news of the gospel could produce. That we are inviting the faithful and the fearful, the loving and the hateful, those like us and those very different from us, to come together with us. We have a gospel that defeats fear, not because it promises we won't ever get sick, but it promises that no sickness can steal our physical resurrection. I want you to imagine what that good news can do in your own heart and then imagine some people that you know who need it. Maybe right now in the chat, just begin to, to type the names of some friends that you're, that you're really concerned about. We can pray with you and, and alongside you for those men and women and even give you some tips on how you can come around them, come alongside them to bring them into a renewed, embodied life with God and his people. And finally, I want this to challenge your actions. I want you to return. I want you to return. Church family, if you're watching this and you've been a part of Lathia for a long time and you just haven't been back to a gathering, I want to encourage you and invite you as your pastor, come home, come home. Come, come get around us, come get around God's people. Get back to your small group. Listen, we've got gatherings near you. We've got small groups everywhere across the greater Boston area. We've got, we've got a church meeting that is close enough to you, I, I promise. We would love to help you get there, but I wanna challenge you to, to start this new embodied reality in a new normal where you allow the good news of God's embodiment to bring you into his embodied physical people to experience his presence that you might know the glory of God, and be able to love God fully by loving him with us and alongside others. Church, I love you, and I am more convinced than ever that these next few months, these next few years, hold the greatest days of our church's life if we'll show up. So God help us show up. In Jesus' name, amen.